Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and it has been an interesting couple of weeks in terms of crewed space exploration. Two weeks ago, Robert Lightfoot basically made an announcement internally that uh, he was instructing the uh, NASA Office of Human Exploration to investigate launching a crew around the moon as part of the first SLS test mission. Then, just yesterday, SpaceX made an announcement they had found a pair of very rich and very brave people who wanted to fly around the moon in 2018 on a Dragon 2 capsule. Now, this is fascinating. This is like another space race, except this time it's the government vehicle against Elon Musk's, you know, private space exploration funded by billionaires. And I'm not sure that should necessarily be taken as any kind of analog for the real world right now, but let's just talk about the technology involved. So, uh, first of all, the mission that had been planned uh, most recently, I guess, or the up until a few weeks ago, the mission that was going to take people back to the moon would be the SLS Exploration Mission 2, which would fly in the 2020s. Moving uh, the first SLS test flight, carrying the um, Orion capsule with the European service module, would have been in 2019. And that would be a flight around the moon. It would park in orbit for a couple of, uh, well, like a week, and then it would return. So SLS is NASA's heavy lift vehicle that they've been developing because they believe that NASA has needs that commercial markets aren't supplying in terms of needing heavy lift vehicles capable of pushing more than 70 tons into low Earth orbit and say 25 tons to the moon. So the SLS Orion, the SLS is built using essentially old shuttle parts. So the first stage is four RS-25 engines burning hydrogen and oxygen. That is the same engines that powered the space shuttle. On the side of that, there's two uh, boosters, which are identical to those used on the space shuttle as well. So essentially you have a space shuttle stack, but without a shuttle stuck on the side, you have a, a payload placed on top of that. So for EM-1, there will then be a second stage, which is the interim cryogenic propulsion stage. That is uh, essentially similar to a Centaur. It's the Delta upper stage. It's going to use a single RL-10 engine burning hydrogen and oxygen again. A very efficient engine used for 50 plus years. So again, very reliable existing engine. And then the upper stage, sorry, the Orion is going to use a European designed and built service module. And the engine on that isn't just going to be the same R, uh, same AJ-10 engine used on the Space Shuttle's orbital maneuvering system, it's actually going to be an engine which flew on the Space Shuttle. So there's a lot of reliable technology which kind of justifies perhaps flying a, uh, a crewed test flight on the very first launch. I mean, and to add into the safety factor, there is also going to be a launch escape system which will have been tested by this point. So while many people heard this announcement of the first SLS test flight being crewed and they thought that's a little bold for NASA, you have to remember that the first space shuttle flight of, of the complete stack, it was also crewed and they hadn't even tested a launch abort system. At least in this case, they will have a launch abort system which they will know works. That will launch, I think, about a 25-ton capsule uh, with a crew presumably of four. This SLS Orion is vastly more capable than the Apollo command module. It's going to have a, a proper water recycling system on board. It's going to use solar cells. Uh, you know, it's, it's a better spacecraft altogether. That's, you know, that's what happened. We've evolved 50 years from what Apollo was, and so the, there's a lot of new technology that gives us improved, uh, you know, improved mass limits. It has been stated, however, to, that to make the EM-1 mission work, they will probably have to cut some corners instead of having the proper life support system they intended to fly on Exploration Mission 2. They will probably have to have something that's uh, intended for just this one mission. Also, the ICPS, the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, uh, that is not human rated. Indeed, NASA was going to make it human rated and then Congress said, no, you should just take this, uh, the, 
exploration upper stage which is similar but has four engines you should just make that you know crew rated instead since em1 is never going to fly with a crew well that's changed now so we don't know whether they're going to uh, man rate the icps or whether they're going to fast track the eus which i don't think is an option to be honest uh that's an interesting question regardless anyway yeah, on the spacex side two private explorers but elon musk that made it very clear that if NASA wanted to buy the seats, they would be welcome, they would take priority. Now, end of 2018, that's not very long. They will have hopefully flown their first crewed test missions to the space station as part of their commercial crew program. Um, and then, yeah, flying out to the moon and back in a week, this would be a different mission profile. So. The, while the Dragon does have you know, propulsion systems and everything on it, it's not going to have the big service module that the Orion capsule will have, so it's probably not going to go into orbit around the moon. It's probably going to be a simple free return trajectory, and the fact that he said it'll be a little more than a week in flight strongly supports this will be literally a swing around the moon and a return to Earth with no time spent in orbit. Also, because they're using cryogenic propulsion, they probably won't spend much time in low Earth orbit either. They may spend maybe one or two orbits at most and then boost directly into a lunar transfer orbit, a free return trajectory. Now, this actually isn't far beyond what SpaceX is already doing. If you look at the mass of the Dragon 2, I think I've seen six and a half tons. The SES-9 mission that was launched to geostationary transfer orbit, that was five and a half tons, and they almost landed that. And when I say almost, they hit the, uh, hit the carrier ship, <laughs> the landing barge, and uh, we, we saw a big hole in the deck. So it's, all, it's not that much heavier than the heaviest thing they've already launched to geostationary transfer orbit. And because of the way orbital mechanics works, it's only about 10% more delta V to go from uh, low Earth orbit. It's only about 10% more to get to a lunar transfer orbit as opposed to geostationary transfer orbit because you're already approaching escape velocity anyway. So it's very, very sensitive to your initial velocity. So the capability is very close to being there with the existing Falcon 9 full thrust. And this is going to be a flight of the Falcon Heavy. That is the one where they strap two extra Falcon first stages onto the side and use that to boost it up. So this is totally within the capabilities. It's a lot lower tech, or it's a lot lighter than what the SLS plan is. So there's definitely air between these two missions. However, this would be something of a coup if Elon Musk could pull this off. I mean, he said for a long time that he thinks that SLS that he could do SLS better. Let's say that he thinks that, that's what I've heard. <laughs> and maybe putting words in people's mouths. Uh, <laughs> that, that Falcon Heavy is gonna be able to put a lot of mass into low Earth orbit, like 50 tons into low Earth orbit. So the 70 tons of the SLS doesn't seem that much more impressive, but that is SLS block one. And there's a series of evolutionary steps which will take its uh, low Earth orbit mass up well above 100 tons. So. There is definitely a potential need for the SLS, but let's not forget uh, Jeff Bezos and his plans. Oh yeah, speaking of rich billionaires who are interested in space, there is the question of who these two space tourists would be. And nobody's telling, but apparently they know each other. So, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe it's Dennis Tito, he's got some more money, maybe uh, James Cameron. I I don't know, it'll be really interesting to see. But as it stands, it's fascinating to see that we have another moon race going on. I, I, while the, while the uh, SpaceX plan is, you know, much more aggressive, it's also much more likely to be delayed. And we're not saying that the NASA plan won't meet with delays either. It's gonna be a really interesting couple of years to see what goes on here. And I'm very excited to see what happens. And I just hope that, hope that there's no problems and that nobody gets hurt, because this is really pushing the envelope in both of these cases. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.